welcome to our tutorial on large scale entity uh, resolution or, uh, for data integration, uh, which is, of course, related to big data. So, my name is Erhard Rahm. I'm a professor at the University of Leipzig in Germany. And my co speaker is Eric Polkart, who is a member of my team and also working in our big data centers, Katz, uh, Dresden, Leipzig. <coughs> So uh, before I start with a technical topic, a brief uh, mentioning of our university, because not most of you are not from Germany, I think. Uh, so the University of Leipzig is uh, founded in 1409. It's 610 years now old, so it's the second oldest university in Germany. And so we have a new campus now in the city of Leipzig. So uh, I'm actually have an office here in this building. Here at this place, at the Augustusplatz in Leipzig, it used to be a church, uh, but it was destroyed in 1968, now the university building resembles a little bit this old church, and but it's now used for university purposes, but it's also um, yeah, an aula which can be used for church services. So um, uh, we have about 30,000 students in our university and 14 faculties. In computer science, we have about 1,200 master and bachelor students. We have master programs on bioinformatics, computer science, uh, digital humanities. We'll soon have a master program on data science. And we have 15 professorships at the moment in computer science, about 120 PhD students and postdocs, mostly funded by a third party money. But this number will uh, grow also in the future. <coughs> so, um, yeah, Leipzig is a city uh, south of Berlin, 600,000 people living there, and very attractive city. And uh, yeah, we are also very good now in. in in football and soccer, so we have a club which is just 10 years old, <laughs> sponsored by Red Bull, but it's number one in the Bundesliga at the moment, and for the second time in the Champions League, and we will play against Lyon, I guess, in a few weeks. <laughs> okay, uh, now we have also since five years already a so-called competence center for big data, which is called SCATS, which stands for Center for Scalable Data Services and Solutions, which is a joint center with the Technical University of Dresden and the University of Leipzig. So there have been, uh, has been a competition about these uh, big data centers in Germany, and there are two of them, one in Berlin and one in Saxony, <coughs> uh, in Leipzig and in Dresden. And now um, we have been able now to extend or to apply for an extension of our big data center to become a machine learning or an artificial intelligence center. And this has now been approved. So we will have a much bigger center starting in November 2019. So just uh, two months. So uh, now we have renamed a little bit SCATS. So, uh, so it's now a center for scalable data analytics and artificial intelligence. So we want to keep the SCATS part, but now we have SCATS AI to also ma mention, of course, this artificial intelligence, which is mostly about machine learning, but also knowledge representation, uh, which is, of course, also a part of artificial intelligence. <coughs> so um, I'm directing the part in Leipzig and uh, Wolfgang Nagel's one in Dresden. And uh, so there are about 15 professors or principal investigators involved, including Markus Krötsch, who gave a tutorial on Tuesday, I think. <coughs> so here's this, uh, this to topic that we work on in our SCAT center, which is still running. And so, uh, yeah, I don't want to go into too many details. So we have uh, some uh, platform related stuff. And here, of course, what is interesting to to our group is this big data integration topic, which here in the middle layer uh, as a prerequisite for data analytics. And of course, we also have visual uh, experts on visualization uh, working with us. And so we try to apply now our research results into different application areas, scientific application areas, but also business cases. And especially the business partners are interested in the data integration approaches that are, are here being developed. And we have also a so-called service center that tries to bring together researchers and application uh, users. And we also run this, uh, Eric Polker is actually directing the Leipzig service center. And uh, so we're also running summer schools and yeah, uh, generating new uh, additional projects uh, to work on, etc. <coughs> Okay, now our new center is called uh, the SCATS AI. It's not good to read. So we have a lot of more topics now in, uh, in this new center. So here we have some base machine learning approaches. Uh, so for example, machine learning on graph data, um, also privacy related topics. 
And here we have the second layer, which is about knowledge management. And here is the topic of Markus Kretsch, knowledge aware computing. And we are working also on knowledge graphs, uh, which also have, of course, a data integration component. And we also have certain kinds of AI applications. So we have many, op many new open positions, uh, which will be advertised uh, shortly. <coughs> Okay, now um, coming now to, the, I mean, you probably all know the, yeah, the challenges for big data, which are also related to data integration. So, it's of course, the volume is the so most obvious one. So, we have big, big data, so uh, petabytes or even exabytes of data to deal with. And this makes really a difference whether we have a small amount of data to integrate or a huge amount of data. So we, it has performance but also quality implications which uh, we'll talk about uh, later. Then of course the variety is uh, very related uh, to data integration because we have heterogeneous data of different formats uh, that need to be uh, combined and integrated uh, to be make it uh, usable for analytics and applications, which is very challenging. And of course, the data is not static, it changes all the time. So we have a velocity dimension. So this is, uh, of course, the case for all data, but especially for local data streams, where data is generated quickly, like from sensors, uh, uh, etc. <coughs> and uh, we also need high data quality. So this is related to veracity. So this is also, of course, an important component of data integration. Uh, because without high data quality, all the analytics are basically meaningless because you get, if you have um, dirty data as input, you cannot get meaningful results. You have to really have clean, curate your data, which has been, of course, discussed to a great extent already at this summer school. Then, of course, all of this has to be, has to have a value for the, for the, uh, for the applications. Otherwise, nobody will invest all this effort to do this uh, data analytics and data preparation. <coughs> so uh, typically we have uh, many workflows involved in data analytics and uh, so this is not new really. It's the same in a way for data warehousing and other technologies, so, but also for big data. So you have to get the data from the web or from other sources and you have to do the data extraction, data cleaning, data curation and then you have to integrate the data from diverse sources, uh, sources and to enrich the data, to annotate the data and after all these preparation steps you can finally do the data analysis and also visualize the result and get it to the human user for, for use or interpretation. <coughs> And these are not new steps, but uh, they become more challenging because of the of these of these features I mentioned already: uh, volume, variety, velocity, etc. And I actually also added now privacy, because if we have uh, person-related data, then of course uh, privacy should be also a very uh, important requirement and should be observed, which is mostly not the case, unfortunately, these days. Okay, now. Um, so what is data integration? Uh, so we want to combine and use data from many sources. So, um, and these sources are of course uh, heterogeneous and autonomous. So the data sets, the data bases, etc., have been created now, of course, independently with specific uh, application focus in mind. So, it's, of course, you cannot expect that different data sources can be easily combined now because they have a different different uh, structure, different. Uh, layouts, etc. So it's really um, uh, a, ch a challenge to to integrate these heterogeneous data sets. So uh, and the goal is now to provide a uniform access to these di diverse data. So to make use of this diverse data, to combine the data, make it better and um, um, make it usable for analysis. <coughs> And roughly we can distinguish two kinds of data integration, physical and virtual data integration. So in the physical data integration approach, the data is uh, basically we create a new data set from these uh, original data sets. So we combine the data in a new database, a new data set for easy access and analysis. So this is the approach that is being applied by data warehouses, but also for knowledge graphs and is actually the approach used in most big data applications. And on the other side, the virtual data integration, we do not physically combine the data sets into a new one, but we leave the data in the original 
um, place and we try to access the data uh, so the up-to-date data basically uh, where the data has been is being maintained so we add just a query layer or a federation layer on top of the different data sources uh, providing this uniform query or access capability so that's the approach of federated databases but also in a way for linked data where we just have links between the data sets and we can query now uh, starting at a certain data set and traversing the links etc <coughs> So now, uh, of course, the question is, uh, what is really better? Um, but of course, there are basically pros and cons in both approaches. So it's not really, uh, man cannot say that one approach is better than the other one. So, uh, so I mentioned here already that for big data, I mostly go for physical data integration because now the data has already been integrated. So at runtime, and we have to do the analysis, you don't have to integrate the data now uh, because everything has been prepared already. So all the data cleaning, all this curation has already been done at the time and we need to analyze the data. So basically that's the big advantage of physical data integration and we can of course uh, spread the data on a cluster and access the data in parallel so we can have very high performance. So this is, uh, has many advantages. On the other side, of course, the data has to be uh, integrated constantly to, to keep the data up to date. This is the advantage of virtual data integration. You always get access to the newest data. You don't uh, have to deal with now any delay now in, uh, in the currency of the data. But of course, access tends to be slow because at runtime, you have to go to different sources to have queries, to combine the query results and everything, or to do data cleaning to some extent, which is time consuming. So, so this is typically not a, not a good approach for high performance. But on the other hand, of course, uh, many of your data that you integrated beforehand, you will never use. So basically, uh, that's also a problem, of course. Uh, so you, now you, have, you don't know exactly in most cases what is really uh, necessary to have integrated. And um, so that would be, of course, a huge effort for only maybe a fraction of the data that you have to have to, in, have to integrate already. <coughs> so anyway, so there are basically uh, these known uh, pluses and minuses of the different approaches. And I, in this talk, will actually focus on physical data integration. So that's our basic approaches uh, for big data because of the performance advantages we get here which is a prerequisite for dealing with high data volumes. Any questions on this or mm -hmm. do you agree? <laughs> and in, in, in the virtual data integration, I was wondering uh, in, if you have uh, data sources that are uh, basically streaming data, so, uh, uh, and you just focus on, on a subset of the data, like the, with this windowing <coughs> approach, uh, it, it's still inefficient, like just, um, um, isolate windows of the data that is coming and you, you kind of consider like a snapshot uh, um, and you replace at each time uh, well, the question is, do you have only one stream of data or several streams? I mean, if you talk about data integration, you would have, to have several streams yeah, of data. Yeah, um, yeah, well, it depends on uh, what is the latency for you to get access to these streams. So if it's more or less close by and you have almost immediate access, then it's not big, much a difference. But then, of course, you would have uh, an extra step to combine the streams in a way. Yeah, of course, there may be hybrid approaches. So uh, that's possible, yes. So even in a federated approach, uh, if you have this extra layer, you can of course store now some of the data or cache the data mm -hmm. that is used more frequently and you don't have to go to the source any time. Mm -hmm. so, so in a way, of course, these are just two, two points in a spectrum and so maybe combination uh, hybrid approaches are also quite uh, attractive. <coughs> Okay, and now, um, okay, data integration has at least two levels. So we have a metadata level or, yeah, and also an instance level. So uh, maybe there are more levels possible, but as at the main uh, levels, I think. So of course, typically data sets have a structure. That's certainly the case for databases, but also um, in other cases, you have uh, records and attributes, etc. So um, you have to understand, of course, what is basically the meaning of the data, basically the structure of the data, and the semantics of the data. And in order to combine now data uh, from different sources with different uh, uh, metadata or schemas, you have to know, okay, what is basically the commonality between the different schemas. So uh, schema matching or, 
ontology matching is basically a main step now uh, to find out what are basically uh, the correspondences here. So typically you may have uh, an editor where you have manually to draw now correspondences between an attribute here and an attribute for the other schema, but you also have of course many opportunities for automatic schema matching to uh, have a system um, create these correspondences for you or make at least recommendations. And then, okay, when you have to combine the data, integrate the data, you know basically what uh, values can be now combined or you don't want to have, of course, want to have duplicate data, you have to make sure that all the data that is corresponding to each other is only represented once in your integrated data set. So um, you may also have want to not only have a mapping between the schemas, but also to physically merge together the schemas into a new a uh, combined schema, uh, so basically you would use the correspondences to find out basically what can be combined into a common attribute and uh, what is basically different and should be basically kept separate now in this um, integrated or merged schema. So a lot of research has been done on schema matching and ontology matching. Less work has been done on the merging part, which is, brings its own challenges uh, with it. <coughs> So in this tutorial, we will more, mostly talk not about the schema matching, but focus on the instance level, the entity level where the real data records or entities are basically um, in the focus. So for example, we may have product data descriptions now on, for web shops. So here we have some cameras with their descriptions and their price. So we more may want to find out, we want to compare the prices of different products uh, product offerings and of course we have to make sure for these price comparisons that we compare the price for the same product. So we have to really make sure that we have matching uh, entities, matching product descriptions in this case. So, um, and of course this is, might be a problem if they are differently described as heterogeneous structure and <coughs> So we may have a lot of data quality problems because of course some information may be missing in some cases and so the formats are different, etc. So this is a quite challenging problem for web data in general. And in, so basically we have to find this, so this, this problem is known as object matching, entity resolution and link discovery for this linked data environment is also basically the same problem, finding entities or concepts that are matching with each other. <coughs> So in some cases, you also want to have not only links or um, matches, but also want to fuse these matching objects together, having a uh, enriched and better representation of the entities. So in both cases, we have a matching part and a merging part if um, for data integration. Okay, and I mentioned already that these um, data integration approach is basically also used for knowledge graphs to curate knowledge graphs. I think we have already, you have already heard about knowledge graphs in the tutorial of Markus Grotsch. Um, so they have become quite popular now in recent years. So they are basically a uniform representation and semantic categorization of entities of different types. Uh, so DBP, Jago, Wikidata uh, are basically examples from the semantic web. But also in the commercial world, Google knowledge graph, of course, is very popular. Microsoft is also having a knowledge graph, maybe Facebook. So I've seen in the slides that this has been considered as debatable, but okay. So we don't have to repeat this here. So, um, so uh, oftentimes these entities in the knowledge graphs are coming from different sources, like Wikipedia in the case of DBpedia, WordNet uh, can be used and other web pages, documents, web search results, etc. So all this information is now co collected, combined possibly within knowledge graphs. And so they provide very valuable background knowledge uh, that can be used for many applications. For example, Google uses his, his knowledge graph for improving search results and so on. So here's a, a figure showing the size of some knowledge graphs. So here you see some, what is this uh, number of entities on the X axis. So this is uh, 38 million for DBpedia and Freebase, which has been uh, replaced by Wikidata, has more, uh, about 50 million entities at the point. This is a paper from the paper from 2015. And so, um, so this is from Microsoft Satori. This is much bigger than these uh, knowledge graphs. And so the whole web is supposed to have 50 billion entities. So, okay, so basically we see that knowledge graphs can be really big. <coughs> 
Okay, and you all know that Google is massively losing these knowledge graphs. So if you're looking, for example, for Lyon on Google, then you get, of course, the normal results. But on the side, you get now information from the knowledge graphs. So basically, you find out, okay, you get uh, some, some photo from Lyon, some map uh, uh, information, and also the, so it's the further information now, uh, the number, the population, etc. So. So you don't have to go to Wikipedia or other sources, you can get directly now the information from the knowledge graph. So this shows how knowledge graphs are basically useful um, for getting more information at the, in the first result page of Google. <coughs> so nobody will go to the other 600 million results. So of course Google wants you to stay longer on the Google results so that you have more uh, time to, to click to some advertisements, etc. <coughs> And so this is common for bigger cities that you get this kind of information. So the most popular entities are cities or geographical entities, persons, movies, etc. So these all are represented now in the knowledge graph. So if you look for a person like René Miller, who was also a speaker, I guess, on Monday, you get this information about her. So the number of citations, the age index, etc. So, but. Uh, I don't think that this is a correct photo of her. <laughs> <laughs> she mentioned on Monday that uh, she never taps her photo. Ah. So no photo of okay. That, that must be the reason. Okay, that's a good explanation. So I actually also tried to find a photo of her now. Uh, I mean, it took me some time. I found one because I know. I knew that he gave a keynote at VLDB in Rio last year, so uh, when you look at the photos of VLDB, you find her. But of course, you have to know how she looks. But, uh, uh, but I don't think this is the right photo. So as you see, the knowledge graphs are not perfect, so it's really uh, possible errors here. Also, Google, I think, tries to, uh, to be quite confident about the information they show here. So that's uh, something, a rare exception, maybe. But anyway, it's never perfect. <coughs> So this just illustrates that knowledge graphs are basically now uh, being used to a large degree. They're very valuable now. Uh, so this data is, of course, integrated from different sources. So this is probably from Google Scholar, the photos coming from somewhere else, etc. So this is really combined information represented in a knowledge graph. So, um, and Amazon is also using knowledge graphs to represent all the product information in such a uh, data structure. So this is a slide from Luna Dong from a tutorial of last year's KDD co uh, conference. So, so at the center of all this is an Amazon product graph. And so this product information is used, of course, for generating recommendations, also for uh, answering queries, uh, et cetera. So, can also be used for internal purposes to mine the graph, to find new patterns maybe, or generate embeddings uh, uh, for learning, for, for machine learning. <coughs> so that shows that these knowledge graphs are really uh, very valuable for the daily business, but also to optimize the internal um, organization. And so the data integrated in the product graph basically comes from different sources. So from, uh, from web pages, from the product catalog and some, some ontology, the product, uh, probably the product yeah, catalog basically is in hierarchy of product categories, etc. And so also have to do some cleaning here, so for schema mappings, entity resolution, knowledge cleaning. So these are the topics basically needed. So entity resolution is really needed now to make sure that every product is only represented once now in this product graph. So, uh, so this shows that, of course, your knowledge graphs have a huge business impact already. So, so the big players, Google, Amazon, etc., are using the te technology to improve their business. And entity resolution or data integration in general is a key uh, component in making this happen. Okay, I mentioned already this virtual data integration with linked data so, or linked open data. So basically you have hundreds of data sources in this yeah, semantic web, so to speak, which are basically interlinked. And so here DVP just in the focus and you have many other uh, sources and here they are colored by domains. So there are bibliographic uh, data sets, the medical data sets, etc. So, and so many of them are interconnected by these same S links, identifying now pairs of entities which represent the same thing, or pairs of concepts are basically equivalent. <coughs> and so that's basically the data integration approach. 
Uh, sorry. Uh, in this context, what's the difference between entity recognition and entity linking? In terms of the product? It's, of course, very similar. So entity linking means uh, yeah, we find maybe in a text some mentioning of a city or of a person, and this can be linked now to a knowledge graph. So you get, okay, you have now the equivalent information in knowledge graph. You can find more information about this person, about the city now. So basically, this is in a way also a link, as the name says. So it's uh, yeah, it's not resolved in a way, but it's just connected, and you can basically combine it if you want into a combined or fused in a representation. But the problem to find the links basically is very similar. Then, uh, so basically, the same techniques can be used. <coughs> So linking is means you have already uh, a background uh, knowledge representation, like a knowledge graph, and you link now an entity. You f try to find this entity in this knowledge graph. Entity resolution is more general. You have two arbitrary data sets, and you want to find the matching, uh, the matching entities. Yes, for example, you don't know whether it's present. It could be, but so. It's a special case in a way, this entity linking for, for entity resolution. <coughs> so you have to have a, a basically a, a reference data set where you have to find the, the matching part. Of course, you have, may have a person which is not represented in the knowledge graph. Of course, you may then de de decide to have to add it now. But yeah, yeah. That's, that's possible. Okay, so um, in this uh, linked uh, open data world, you have basically both possibilities. You have, as I said, this linking basically is a kind of virtual data integration because you leave the data sets, the data entities in the original sources. You do not combine them necessarily into a new uh, data source. However, you can do that, of course, So, which is the case for knowledge graphs, for example. So you can have both physical and virtual data integration here. So because individual sources like DVP integrate already knowledge from other sources, or also Wikidata or Yago, etc. So basically, these would be physically integrated data sets uh, of sources in this in this uh, linked open data cloud. But on the other hand, you might not have uh, you have just normal data sources which are just interlinked with other ones. And the main approach, however, is now to use query languages like Sparkle to access now these data sources and all the traverse links, which is. Yeah, it's, it's not so easy to use, I think. And uh, of course, as I mentioned, with all federated approaches, it's quite low, uh, slow and also error prone and not really scalable. Because you as a user has to know what are the data sources I have to, to, to go to to find some information. And of course, you have no idea where you find interesting information. In many cases, you may just go to two or three data sets and that's about it. But you will not easily be able to combine all the information about a certain entity that is available now in this uh, huge number of data sources. So, so I'm not very not a fan of this federated approach, but you can do that. It's complementary. <coughs> okay. Um, so, what are the main steps in data integration? I mentioned them in principle already. So, so in a way, this is the first part of the workflow we have seen in the beginning. Uh, before we do the data analysis, so we have the data extraction, data transformation, cleaning, and then we have the schema matching part the entity resolution part, and then the option can also fuse together the entities. So the main focus will be on entity resolution here in this tutorial. I think you heard about data curation and data transformation already uh, yesterday, and uh, so that's covered already. <coughs> Hello. Yes. The comment on the order between schema matching and entity resolution. Yes. <laughs> I agree with what you said. But there might be cases where right. the other way around. That's right. If the entity is sort of a first class citizen, then you first look at uh, correlating uh, instances of the entities, if you know that uh, those are the entities you are interested in. And then you uh, consider the matching, let's say, of uh, minor attributes. You use a uh, first name, I use a uh, given name. But uh, you have already made some entity resolution on people, and then you look at the matching on the attributes, which are definitely part of the schema. But 
this is clearly subordinate. Yeah, that's a very good point. I will also come to it later because you are completely right. So in, in very difficult cases, it's quite helpful if you know already some uh, matching entities that helps you, of course, finding all the matches for the attributes. So you might have just some training data, and so that would be enough maybe to find now uh, matches for, for attributes. So, but then here was the assumption, okay, before we have can match basically entities, we should know what are the attribute pairs that can be compared at all. So that's the reason why I had schema matching before entity matching. But you're right that in some cases you might have some, yeah, some change in the ordering or a mixed approach, so... Uh, or you might even have virtuous loops. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's, I mean, that's in a very simplification, uh, which is uh, the normal case if you can go straight forward, but in complex, more complex case, I will mention also later, so maybe we can we come back to this point then. <clears throat> okay, now I think uh, this data integration is called a very old problem. Uh, so many decades uh, researchers have working on this already, so, uh, but still uh, there are some new challenges uh, which are not really completely solved and uh, basically, uh, basically uh, give room for more PhD thesis, more research. So, uh, and I will touch on some of these challenges. So data quality has been uh, mentioned already. So we have unstructured and semi-structured sources. We need data cleaning and enrichment. So uh, then, of course, large-scale data integration means we have to deal with large amounts of data and also metadata, and not only with two or three sources, but with many sources. So that's, I guess, I guess the important aspect that is mostly not been uh, focused on how do we deal with hundreds of sources now? How can we integrate data from such a big number of data sources? or maybe even tens of thousands or even millions of web tables, for example. So that's not so um, easy to do. <coughs> and of course, this is there's a runtime component. The runtime should be very short, so we can <coughs> apply techniques to reduce the search space for matching, like uh, with blocking, or we can apply parallel processing with Hadoop clusters, GPUs, etc. And what, uh, with what is related to the topic of many sources, what I call is holistic data integration is needed. So we want yeah, holistically use the data from many sources now uh, and not having just two or three sources maybe. So and the key point here is to go away from just linking now the data. Uh, with, it's basically a binary approach. So we have links are always connecting two entities from two sources. So that's not enough. So when we have many data sources, we have to have clustering of uh, all the corresponding elements uh, in the schema or even at the entity level. So we need really clustering approaches um, to combine the matching components in many, from many sources. So binary mapping is not enough anymore. I'm not saying it's needless, but of course it's still a building block, binary mapping, but in the end we want to have clusters of matching elements. And this will be a main component in our later talk or so, okay. And of course, uh, runtime is not everything. We have to have high match quality. So we have uh, always to combine different similarities to get uh, a good prediction of matches. And it's very important to use uh, machine learning approaches, supervised machine learning approaches, making use of training data. And here we can also employ now, uh, for example, representation learning or embeddings to improve now the data input, for example, in text input, so basically, the, the embeddings uh, use some vocabularies that are known already to uh, give a more concise representation of, of some words and terms, and which basically have a better semantic expression and improve the match results. So, and of course, we have to support evolution and change. So we have constantly changes in the data sources. We have new data sources to integrate. And so basically, so static, uh, most work, most previous work had static entity resolution. So we have fixed data sets and we, we integrate them once. But what is basically needed, of course, is we have to constantly now add new data entities and new data sources. So that's something which leads to more dynamic or incremental data integration, which is not a uh, well-researched topic. <coughs> so in principle, we should only look into incremental or dynamic entity uh, resolution and data integration, and batch static data integration might not be the right approach anyway. So, so as we will see, this is a, quite a difference. 
Okay, in some cases, if you have a knowledge graph, for example, we have not only entities, but we also have relationships. So basically, we have for data integration, we have to deal with both these entities and their relations. So uh, if you want to combine two knowledge graphs into one, uh, or yeah, or many more uh, knowledge graphs into one, you also have to take care about these uh, different relationships. And you also have not only one entities of one type, but you have many different types of entities. So if for publications, you have publications, you have authors, you have conferences and so on. Relationships are author relationships, citation relationships. So all these different kind of uh, entities and relationships have to come together. So you need some uh, yeah, approach, some strategy, how to integrate these different uh, entity types and relations now in a good order, in a good way, so to get good uh, overall quality in the end. And in some cases, you, if you have really new entities coming in and new relationships, you may not even know, okay, what is the type actually of the entity. For example, in the product knowledge graph, you may have a new product offer and you have to first determine, okay, what is this product at all? Is it a camera or is it a smartphone and so on? So basically just looking at the values, you may first find out this uh, entity type before you can basically match it now with other entities. So if you don't know the type of an entity, it's really difficult. <clears throat> okay, and so the final thing is all the privacy for sensitive data. So this calls for specific techniques, also for entity resolution or record linkage, which basically is not using now uh, yeah, privacy um, critical information like name, address, etc., but uses some encoding uh, on, the, on this information, but still be able to do the matching. And also for data mining or machine learning, this is also an aspect that is very important. So that's also something which is really a hot topic and needs more research. Okay, so uh, before, um, uh, so now I'll briefly want to explain a little bit more this holistic data integration idea. So what we need is a scalable approaches to integrate many data sources, uh, so n uh, much bigger than two. And uh, of course the need for these approaches is quite clear because we have many many data sources, for example, on the web, many thousands of web shops with product information. We have hundreds of data sources in the linked open data cloud, and we have data lakes, as you probably have heard from Randy Miller, uh, with millions of, of different tables that have valuable information, which is more or less not easily uh, explored or used. So it would be really good if you could combine information from all these many data sources. So, and if you want to do just pairwise matching, you get a problem. So, uh, if you have 200 sources only, then you would have basically, you have pairwise mapping, would, would say, okay, we have 200 times 200 divided by two, gives you 20,000 mappings. So, and I don't think the current tools are basically able to create 20,000 mappings and to also keep these up to date uh, in the presence of changes. So, that's not a very scalable approach. So uh, basically this shows this mapping idea only works for very few data sources. So because the number of mappings you have to determine and uh, keep update explodes simply. So uh, I'm not saying that we don't need pairwise matching, but uh, the end result should not be the mappings. So you need these pairwise mapping, uh, matchings, but in the end you want to have these clusters of uh, matching entities. So basically in one cluster, if you have K sources, you can combine, of course, all the matches coming from the different sources in one cluster. So you don't have many individual links. So basically every entity in a cluster matches with every other entity in the cluster. So in a cluster you implicitly represent many, many links in a more compact way. <coughs> and then you only have to keep up to date your clusters, but not all these individual links. So uh, what you also can do now, okay, you can fuse together the cluster into a, um, a one entity or you just pick one of the entities in the cluster as a representative or maybe enrich this representative. So in a way this cluster representative is a special entity that combines the relevant information for the different entities. And so the new entities that you have to integrate, they're only compared with this cluster representative, but not necessarily with all the other entities in your cluster. So basically this simplifies now the way you integrate new data. So this is shown here. So what you get now in the end is for every entity type in your knowledge graph, for example, you have a set of clusters. So these are basically all the matches of a certain entity. So the bigger bubble basically means the cluster representative. And so you have, of course, the same situation for all different entity types. 
And then, of course, new data comes in, and then, okay, the new entities are just compared now. You first have to determine, okay, what is the entity type? So is this an author or is this a publication, for example? And then you just check now the clusters of the specific entity type, and you find now the matches. Okay, what is the cluster that is matching? If you have a matching cluster, you just add this to the cluster. If you don't find a match, you create a new cluster. So this is incremental matching with these kind of clusters. A relatively easy idea, but I mean, it's different what you normally see for entity resolution. <coughs> Yeah, there should be no disjoint clusters normally. Yeah, we will have a separate section, as we'll see, on clustering when showing the different approaches. So can you hear me in the back or? Good. So, okay. So this was the introduction now. Uh, <laughs> okay, in the next part, uh, I will give some basics about uh, entity resolution, also some of our tools for using Hadoop uh, on entity resolution, and also again coming to this use case of holistic data integration for product offers that we did already a couple of years ago. And then the second part, Eric will take over and talk about entity clustering, which is the main focus here. And we have a new tool called Famer, which is also recommended for the challenge. So uh, we may also be able to give you some hints now how to use it. And uh, or I will also mention some alternatives to our own tools that could also be used uh, for the challenge. So we're not necessarily using just our tool. So this Famer basically also supports incremental entity resolution. And at the end, if you have still time, I can also talk a little bit about our recent work about privacy preserving record linkage. We had a demo at last week's VLDB in Los Angeles, so this could also be covered if we have still time. <coughs> and if you still have time, we can also discuss a challenge uh, if you had a, would have had problems with the video, I don't know. Okay, now um, I think most of you know what is uh, object matching entity resolution. So we have to identify semantically equivalent objects or entities either in one data source or between different data sources. So this is an old problem. For example, in the relational case, you may have two databases with customer information. So here's the one table. Uh, so you see already the schema problem. So I have used this, the same color for the corresponding attributes. So here have a name attribute, here have last name, first name, and there's different attributes. You have gender, M and F, and here have sex, uh, zero and one, so different representations. And here the address is just one attribute. Here have split street and city and so on. So if you now want the problem is, okay, do we have any matching customers now in the two tables? So that would be the challenge. Okay, so how do you do that? Of course, you have to know what can be compared at all, you know? Uh, so basically, this would be the first problem that we might have to combine these two uh, attributes into one and have these two combined to compare against a dress. But of course, looking only at one attribute is normally not enough. So just looking at the name, okay, we have many Smiths, so Smith is a very frequent name. Of course, you're, you're out of luck if you're just looking at the name. So it's not clear from the name alone, so you also may have to look into other attributes like the address information, okay. And then in the end you might find out, let's see, uh, okay, so this is South Fork, maybe this second person is matching the first person here. So this is a possible match, but it's only possible to, yeah, to with a certain degree of certainty to, 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 to say this. Uh, and normally you have to combine uh, information or similarities from several attributes. So I mean, matching person information is really not simple and there are many tools just for this purpose. Uh, so this is really business, business value to do this in a good way. <coughs> okay, so original focus was on structured data. And of course, in the web data, things are getting more complicated. So Google Scholar is doing already this holistic data integration I mentioned. So they cluster together all the publications that they find on the web and also in the reference sections of the publications. So they do quite a good job in clustering together these publications. So, so my data cleaning paper from 2000, they have 26 versions now found, but it's not perfect. So this cluster is quite good. But so you see there are many variations of the same papers. So, uh, so because of course uh, there are some problems with the web data extraction. You see uh, if you compare, so here's the problem end. It's here replaced by this, uh, with this end representation. And here in some cases the, the journal is mentioned in the title. And also the authors are maybe, this, uh, here the, the, the first name becomes the last name. 
And so in each of these entities, uh, these, these representations, you have a different problem. So here the second author is mentioned as a title and so on. So basically, uh, okay, if you want to have the real number of citations, you would have to add maybe uh, the different things together. So it's not the, it's quite good, but it's not the complete number maybe. Yeah, well, they, they have access to publisher data. They have uh, access, of course, across the whole web. So if you put a paper on your web page, two days later, it's in Google Scholar. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so they're very good. Yes. They didn't force publish the paper because it's in the reading. Yeah, yeah. And it's even happened that Google Scholar attributed a publication to another who was not co-authoring this publication. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, this shows it's not easy to, to have a perfect result, so, but uh, they're doing quite a good job. So, Okay, so now we have another workflow for just for entity resolution. So we have yeah, either one data set or two or more data sets as input. Then we have to reduce the search space. We don't want to compare every entity with every entity, which would be a quadratic uh, complexity, which would not be feasible for a very large data set. So we have a blocking or a filtering step to reduce the search space. And then we compute all the similarities between the relevant attributes, and we make either directly a match prediction or a match classification, where the two entities are this is binary mapping, basically. Uh, so many tools just stop at this point. So, but uh, okay, for holistic integration, you need another step called for entity clustering. So what you get here is basically a so-called similarity graph, having a link, a similarity link between similar entities, but this is not necessarily the perfect match link. But the entity clustering decides now which of the links are basically taken over, which basically result into uh, taking these two entities in the same cluster. But in some cases, the link is not strong enough, so you might basically ignore it. So basically, entity clustering should be very intelligent uh, to do this final decision, and the output would be a set of clusters of matching entities. So, uh, so basically, for each of these three uh, components, you have many approaches uh, that you can uh, choose from. <coughs> So, and uh, there are also some special cases depending on our, whether our data sources are clean or not so clean. Well, clean sources mean I don't have duplicates in the source. So if the data sources basically, so for example, DBLP is a relatively clean data source. So you don't have normally pub duplicates in DBLP. So basically, you don't have to look for duplicates in DBLP. So if you know this is a clean data source, you should not try to <laughs> do another cleaning step for this data source. But on the contrary, but if you have another data source like ACM Digital Library, which is also relatively clean, so it's much easier to compare or find matches in two clean data sources than having very uh, dirty data sources. So because for two clean data sources, you know, you have at most one match in the other source. So you have a one-to-one -one match problem, which is uh, very nice and can be used now uh, to improve your match result. Otherwise, uh, with dirty sources like Google Scholar, with many duplicates, of course, you have to look for many duplicates in the other source. <coughs> So basically for clustering, this means if you have n uh, clean data sources, then your cluster size is at most n, because for each data source, you can have at most one entity in a cluster. So basically this is a constraint that is being used also in FEMA uh, for generating these entity clusters. Uh, if you don't have clean data sources, the question is, okay, do we clean the data source first before we do matching with other data uh, sources or not? So that's... Uh, not so easy to answer. Normally in data warehousing, the idea was usually, okay, we first clean our data source before we do uh, matching with other data sources. This is some effort, but it simplifies now this is a second matching problem. Here, I only mean uh, whether we have duplicates or not in the data source. In DBLP, uh, if we have every paper that goes once in the in the source, then it's duplicate-free or clean. So missing boundaries does not. 
No, that is also a problem of cleanliness, of course, but here for the duplicate detection or matching, this is the main aspect. Do we have duplicates or not? But of course, you're right, there are many other data quality problems. <coughs> okay, good. <laughs> Okay, I don't have the time to go into the detail of all these steps, but uh, we'll be quick on, on some of the points. So because I think you also had heard already something from the other talks. So I mean, uh, as I said, blocking, if you have, an don't blocking, uh, you have a pairwise matching of all entities, which is not scalable. So we really have to reduce the search space. And blocking is the most frequently used approach. So we, uh, yeah, there are many, uh, many possibilities here. So standard blocking, okay, you just use some attribute or a set of attributes to decide uh, uh, how to partition now your entities now in partitions or blocks, and you only want to compare now entities from the same partition or the same block. For example, you might have only the papers with the same publication year. So basically, publication year could be a blocking key. So you would only compare the papers of the same publication year. It's a little bit dangerous because this might not be the same year really. So, so basically, this shows it might be not enough having only one blocking key, but maybe you have to consider also another blocking key like uh, the, first, uh, the first three letters of the title or something else. So there are many possibilities, but the, end, uh, the, main, the main point is we reduce the number of comparisons to the entities of the same block, which basically drastically reduces the overall number of comparisons. So another idea which is, has the same effect but is different in nature is filtering. So here we have to know already what is basically our matching approach and what is frequently be used are so-called similarity joints. So this is, we have some similarity functions between two entities and we only consider them as matching if the similarity exceeds a certain threshold. So basically oftentimes you have a string similarity, for example, on title or maybe also on several attributes. And if we know the similarity functions like the maybe Shaka or dice similarity for for the strings, then we, by the definition of these strings, we can exclude certain combinations of entities which do not match, uh, we cannot even match, because if the length, for example, of two titles is very different, they can never have a similarity of 80 or 90 percent. This is just by the definition of the string similarity. So this is a very length, simple length filter, which excludes many pairs for, from, uh, from comparison, and there are other more sophisticated uh, filter approaches. So for example, if you have a metric similarity uh, function or a metric distance function, like uh, edit distance uh, or Shakar, we can also use the so-called triangle inequality, uh, which has also been used in some approaches to reduce the number of comparisons. So this is uh, basically an orthogonal optimization, orthogonal to blocking, which in the end uh, also reduces the number of comparisons uh, to a very large degree, possibly. Uh, yes. I didn't understand the, the comparison. Yeah, the comparison of like the computation of similarity joints wouldn't end up being quadratic. Well, this you mean uh, to check uh, to check whether you have to to match basically. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You have, uh, but that's a lightweight check in a way. So, so for example, the length filter. Uh, okay, it's easy to find out. Okay, this is I don't know, there's this length and this length. So it's it's of course you have uh, you're right. You have a, a base overhead is always involved per pair. So in a way, the question is, uh, is the difference between the base overhead and the real match overhead is really so significant that we can still get a big uh, gaining. So in, in the normally, it's, it's a big difference because the similarity functions can be quite expensive to compute uh, if you have several similarities and so on. So, but it's, it's, it's true, it's a good point actually. <coughs> So basically, therefore, blocking is actually mostly used, but this can also be used uh, as an additional uh, aspect. Okay, so as I mentioned already, standard blocking uses just uh, uh, one or two blocking keys or several blocking keys. So either one attribute of a manufacturer for products or maybe a function on several attributes, maybe the first two letters of the first order, maybe with the last two uh, digits from the publication year could be a blocking key. Then you only combine or compare papers with the same value for this function. And then, of course, you can find out, okay, what, how good is my blocking function? Uh, for example, does it reduce now the pair relevant pairs to compare? So pair completeness is one big, a good metric reduction ratio. What is basically the, the savings compared to the naive approach where we do have any, don't we have any blocking? 
and path quality is, uh, I don't think that's so important for blocking because it tries to reduce the number of non-matching pairs to a large degree, but that's something which goes into the direction of precision, which is actually mainly the point of the matching step which comes after blocking. And uh, what you have to do in practice is, as I said, sometimes you have multiple blocking keys to improve, now improve the recall, uh, but it of course goes uh, at the expense of a, a less good uh, reduction ratio. <coughs> Okay, what is really important for blocking, uh, I mean, there are many, many approaches I don't have the time to talk about. There are maybe uh, really survey papers about just about blocking, but from the practical point of view, it is really important to, uh, if you apply blocking, to make sure that your block sizes are not becoming too big, because a block size in the end determine how expensive it is really to do all the comparisons. And uh, also, blocking does not go, give, uh, does not, uh, of course, eliminate the quadratic complexity. That's also important. Because if you have n entities and you have, say, k blocks, and in the ideal case, all blocks are about the same size. So otherwise, if you have big differences in the block size, the big blocks, of course, uh, determine your runtime. So in the best case, you have about the same size. Uh, so, 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 so the block size would be n divided by k. So you have k times the number of comparisons would be n divided by k. So this would be the number of comparisons, so it would be n squared still, divided by 2k. So you see the quadratic complexity is still remaining. So, uh, so you can only achieve uh, very good performance if the k is so big that it basically is really going down this expression. So otherwise, you will have a really a bad performance. So, uh, and so a small block size are really important now also. So, and then the question is, okay, I was at Sigmod and listening to a talk about the Magellan tool and say, okay, we do our configuration for a small data set and then we use the same configuration for a big, for a much bigger data set in the, in the cloud environment. And I was skeptical, oh, does it really work? I mean, how can you now simply assume now that a configuration for a small data is also applicable to big data? So, so as this would mean big data is not a problem. We just optimize for small data and we are able to solve this for big data. So and the question is, okay, can we use the same blocking configuration when the data size increase strongly? So and the answer is quite obvious. Uh, the answer is no, because uh, if you have, let's say, 100 times the data size, we would get, of course, 10,000 uh, times now as the number of comparisons, and even with blocking, unless the number of blocks also goes up uh, significantly by a factor of 10,000, which is almost impossible. So, uh, so basically, um, it, so still keeping small block size for big data, for much bigger data, is really a challenge. So, so just keeping the same blocking configuration is uh, normally not doable uh, with big data. So, <coughs> so basically you have to change your blocking definition. So for example, if you used the first three letters of your title as a blocking key, okay, you could longer prefix in like five, uh, the first five letters uh, etc. But of course now you have a greater risk that you miss some of the matches because you have a more restricted uh, uh, definition of your blocking key. You may have to, to use now more blocking keys to uh, compensate this. So, so there's also some approaches for automatically now controlling block sizes by adapting this blocking function. So this was a paper I co-authored with somebody from Australia uh, in KDD 2015. So uh, this is um, I mean, in, in the papers, you normally don't see much about uh, how the blocking function is really defined. So if you get now performance results and you don't know how blocking has been selected, you cannot really tell much about the quality, the performance of a, a specific approach. Okay, now matching, as I said, you have to combine several similarity values, uh, attribute similarities, but also maybe context-based matching. So you have only, in a rela if you have a graph-based situation, you can also look at the neighbors of an entity for example, publication similarity could be using the author similarity. <coughs> and so similarity joints I mentioned. So the problem with similarity joints is the dependency on the threshold. So, uh, so if you have a very clean data, that's fine. Then you can pick a very high threshold, 90% 90 or something. But if you have not so clean data, you have to go down with your threshold. And so in this case, all these ideas for filtering basically really are no longer applicable very well. So basically all these ideas are really not performing well anymore. And so basically also for big data, 
So if you have, let's say, a threshold of 90%, that's okay for small data. But with big data, many, many pairs are exceeding the threshold. But uh, the question is, do they all match these pairs above the threshold anymore? So that's questionable. So I think, um, I don't think that similarity join is really a good idea for dirty data or big data. So, but anyways, there are lots of papers about the similarity joins or the survey papers. Okay, so, but you also can come up with some manually defined rules. For example, two papers match if the title similarity is uh, above 90% and the author similarity is about above 40%. So you see, have several similarities combined and having just one threshold, but multiple thresholds. But that's very difficult to define manually, these kind of rules. So you can have a try and error approach to find out some approaches that uh, seem to perform well. But then uh, for difficult cases, you probably are better uh, served with machine learning. So you have some training data and you uh, feed a classifier. And uh, basically this gives you in most cases the best uh, matching strategy. So this is also an old idea already, not just uh, of the recent hype about machine learning. So for example, decision trees, logistic regression, support vector machines, and all these approaches are busy being used since more than a decade for entity resolution. So here's a simple example for a decision tree to determine ma matches between papers. So you see the most important attribute is in the, in the root. So you have a cosine similarity about title. If it's about a certain threshold, then you continue. If it's a tree crumb similarity, but also is also above a threshold, then you decide a match. So you see these similarity values can be also arbitrary numbers here between zero and one. And so this path basically is one match rule basically, but you may have now many passes leading to a match. So yes, a match rule basically is yeah, a or combination of several uh, end, uh, end conditions. Uh, basically this shows that it's much more complex than a manually created match rule. And you may also have a random forest where you have multiple decision trees and you combine now the result of these decision trees into a combined result, which gives normally better quality if you have enough training data. And now deep neural networks are also being used for this kind of approach. You need even more training data for them, uh, but they can also get comparable or maybe sometimes even better results depending on your data. It's quite good for text, text oriented data, long descriptions in attributes, so that's a good approach. And of course, you can also use these embeddings uh, to improve the matchability and so on. <coughs> so, but really for the training data, you have to make sure that your training data is in a way balanced. You have to provide matches and non-matches in your training data. So in the challenge, uh, for people who are using our challenge, we have provided you with matches, true matches as a possibility for training data, but you also have to determine non-matches uh, because you need both, that your classifier can use the knowledge from pairs that are matching and pairs that are non-matching. So, uh, so, and the non-matches should, should be non-trivial, otherwise they're not very informative. So, uh, so they should have a certain similarity, but still not still non matching. Otherwise, they're not so informative, as I said. And of course, you don't want to spend too much time to manually label now the entity pairs for training. So, so we investigated a couple of ten years ago already uh, the impact of. Um, so what? Yeah, we wanted to find out. Okay, we have a ratio between matches and non-matches in our training set. So this ratio 0.4 means that we have at least 40% of the pairs we provide as training are either matching or non-matching. So we have in a way a balanced, a more or less balanced distribution about matches and non-matches. And the question is, do we randomly pick our um, non-matches or do we try to have a certain similarity about um, the non-matches also? So we have here uh, a tree crumb similarity used uh, for a similarity threshold. And here is a simple match problem, DBLP with ACM. You see, okay, here it's not really so important uh, whether we observe this. And we also have a random uh, yeah, it's a baseline strategy with, without machine learning. So even with this baseline, we get 90% F measure. And uh, here's a more complex product matching approach. So the baseline was not so good, 65% F measure and with machine learning, we get much better uh, F measure. And here the uh, blue is random and this, uh, yeah, this ratio, this balanced match and non-match are performing better over a longer range of initial similarity values. So, so of course the similarity threshold should not be too high, but uh, should have at least 0 .0, uh, uh, 0 0.3 similarity between the non-matches uh, to be used now in our training. So, 
So this shows that machine learning is better for complex matches than uh, non-machine learning and that uh, you shouldn't, should have a balanced uh, <coughs> mix of matches and non-matches. So, okay. Um, so there are many tools now for entity resolution and we actually started already 10 years ago to evaluate some of them to find out, okay, what are the commonalities, what are basically the best tools, what are the poorest pools and tools and so on. And so in our initial comparison, uh, we investigated 11 tools which are using learning or non-learning approaches, but we found out they are quite similar in terms of functionality regarding blocking and the match techniques, uh, primarily using attribute level matching and you had to manually find the blocking keys as well as to uh, apply the matchers. So uh, the training-based approaches used manual training. And at that time, the most popular learners have been decision tree and SVM. But the evaluation results were not comparable because everybody was using different data sets, different benchmarks. And so as usual, the, pre the papers presented very good results, but uh, you could not compare the results with other papers. So. What we did is we did our own evaluation. Uh, it was a VLDB paper for these two data sets that I mentioned, bibliographic, e-commerce, and some others. So, and we uh, observed the learning-based approaches achieve better match quality for the more complex problems. Um, because it's really difficult now to find good combinations of the similarities. And the tools, however, were very relatively slow and they really could only be executed even on the small problems with blocking. Uh, so they had really performance issues at the time. So, so in principle, the, the learning-based approaches have apparently higher resource requirements and need uh, blocking and maybe also parallel processing. So more recently, we also investigated link discovery tools. Uh, all the dozens of tools have been uh, proposed and developed for link discovery. In the initial, the focus has been on ontology matching, but lately uh, they also looked into instance matching, so in a way entity resolution. So, and there is this contest going on for a long time from the OAEI, and so we considered about 10 tools again. And uh, so some of them used learning and uh, some also are applicable to ontology matching and so on. So again, uh, mostly very simple property or attribute matches have been used. Um, so basically, I mean, in this knowledge area, of course, you have all the links, the relationships with other entities. So it would, would be quite uh, normal to also use this neighborhood information, but that has not been used by these tools. And even blocking has not been used to a large degree. And, but uh, learning-based approaches were also quite, uh, quite uh, popular. <coughs> And uh, also what the plus is that all, most of these tools are open source, are easily available. And, uh, but uh, there was no evaluation, no comparison for the tools for large set data, large scale data sets. So the scalability is questionable in most cases. And, uh, and of course they only consider binary linking but not clustering. So that's also a limitation of these link discovery tools. Okay, so anyway, so all these uh, studies uh, led us to develop our own tools. Um, so one of our early tools was ddupe, was a deduplication using Hadoop. So this was uh, already 2012 or so. At that time, Apache Flink and Spark were not available, so we just had to use MapReduce. But MapReduce is also, of course, available in the Apache Spark. So a tool that uses Map and Reduce functions is also basically, uh, can also be implemented in a similar way with Apache Spark. So at that time, uh, we had to uh, to think about how can we use map reduced shops to do all this uh, blocking and matching and so on, clustering. So we implemented that in this tool. And so we also have a library of match and blocking techniques. We have a possibility for learning. And we also had a GUI now to specify now our strategy. And we automatically generate the map reduced shops for this defined uh, match strategy. And what we also <coughs> is a major plus of this approach is we in a parallel environment, uh, you get a load balancing problems. And you, what you need is really a load balancing strategy to make use of your cluster in a good way. <coughs> so we also have for entity clustering, we just use transitive closure or connected components, which is the simplest approach. Uh, but uh, it was already quite expensive with MapReduce to implement. And as we will see in the talk by Eric Poikert, this is not, of course, the best possible clustering approach. <coughs> so
So I still have 30 minutes, right? Yes. In the first part. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, so what we did is uh, in this dedupe, um, okay, we have this usual pipeline. So I have not entity clustering here. So we do uh, blocking and then the molarity computation and the match classification. And if you use a learning based approach, we first have to determine, of course, the, uh, the classifier with using machine learning. So this is a separate map reduced job that we did uh, in the learning based approaches. And um, so what we ended up in basically the main pipeline is just one map reduced job, as we will see in a minute. And uh, this classifier training is another map reduced job. And for load balancing, we may additionally have a data analysis job here before this uh, main workflow, uh, and we will see how it will work also in a, in a moment. <coughs> and uh, we have a library, as I said, uh, different approaches for learning and for, uh, for blocking and uh, similarity functions and so on. Okay, now what is the problem with uh, yeah, the load balancing problem? Basically, uh, I mean, um, I guess most of you are familiar with map and reduce or, or or anybody not uh, familiar with this. So anyway, we have our data spread in a shared nothing approach about uh, n machines. So basically, and each machine basically can in the map function apply any, uh, any, any, uh, any computation now on the input records of the partition. So in this case, we use a blocking function to apply for every record a blocking function and we tag basically the blocking key uh, in front of each record. So then basically, uh, okay, let's see it here, we see it. Uh, here's a map face. So here are the input records from the different partitions. So we have just two partitions here. So each, each record here is now uh, read in parallel now on the different machines. And you here see the symbols represent different blocking keys. So every record has, of course, associated a blocking key depending on your blocking function. And then the, the records are redistributed based on the blocking key. So every uh, record with the same blocking key goes to the same machine, to the same reducer, so to speak. And then here we basically have now all the records from the different machines which have the same blocking key. So here see the yellow ones, and here the green ones, and so on. So and then the reduce phase basically does the matching by comparing now all the entities of the same block with each other. And all the set is in parallel now with all the other machines. So we have parallel processing in the map phase and also in the redistribution phase and also in the in the reduce phase for matching. <coughs> so that's very easy to implement and uh, works quite well. The only problem is, okay, what happens if the block is, the blocks have different size? And normally they have different size. And of course then you really get in uh, load balancing problems because the big blocks have of course many more computations, many more comparisons than the small blocks. So uh, the question is can we distribute our blocks in a way that all the machines are basically evenly uh, utilized without creating bottlenecks. Otherwise, you cannot expect a good speed up with your machines uh, because of these uh, bottlenecks. So that's a really important aspect and it's the same problem for, for Spark, for Flink and so on. So uh, even in FEMA, we also have the same problem and we applied our load balancing strategy from Dedupe already also in FEMA. <coughs> okay, so we have data queue basically, for example, in a in the product case, of course, there are popular products with many offers and niche products which have very few products. So we get a data skew now in the values and uh, therefore different block sizes. So basically big blocks prevent now utilization of more than a few machines. The scalability is limited and efficiency. And in a cloud environment, you have to pay for every machine you use. And if you're not able to use the machine because of load balancing issues, of course, you still have to pay but you cannot make use of the machines, so that's not a good idea. Okay, so what we do now for load balancing is we have this extra map reduce job in the beginning to analyze now the value distribution now in our data. So the block for the blocking key, for example, and then we can estimate the size of the resulting blocks for our blocking key. And okay, then we can observe what are the big blocks and uh, which will create prob problems. And then we have to find a load balancing, basically that makes sure that uh, depending on our blocking key can still uh, assign now the number of pairs to compare now among the reducers that they basically evenly utilized. So in a very simple, uh, we have several schemes now, but the most simple one is 
so-called block split approach that we were published in ICDE, so that's a typo in 2012 already. <laughs> so block split, they, as the name implies, big blocks are split now into smaller blocks and uh, uh, distributed now in this, uh, among the reducers. <coughs> okay, I have now one slide illustration of block split. So we have two uh, products, uh, the, the, the blocking is on product types. So we have, well, these are really outdated product types here. Uh, so at that time we had MP3 players and cell phones, but now of course we could use AirPods, I don't know, and cell phones, whatever. So uh, anyway, we have two blocks. One has only three entities and the other one has uh, six entities. So uh, if you compare now the entities to the blocks, you get in the naive approach, here we have three pairs to compare and here we get 15 pairs. So altogether we have 18 pairs now to compare with the two blocks. And of course the big block basically, uh, yeah, basically determines the overall runtime. These 15 pairs of course take much longer than the three pairs. So basically the execution time for 15 pairs determines the parallel processing time for two machines. So the speed up will be 18 over 15, which would be just 20% faster than without parallel processing. So this is not a very good speed up. So uh, the idea is, okay, we have to split now the big block into sub-blocks, basically. And, oops. Okay, um, what we can find out is, okay, 18 is the overall number of, of, of uh, comparisons. So ideally, we would assign each reducer nine comparisons. So the small block is fine because it's three is this lower, is this smaller than nine. So we don't have to do anything with the small blocks. So the small blocks are left uh, untouched. Only the big blocks uh, with the number of comparisons above this threshold of uh, nine uh, would have to be split. So, uh, so here basically we split this uh, uh, block now into two sub blocks because every uh, basically we do this just by the data which comes from the different machines here from the different map partitions so basically uh, in this case we assume two of, two of these uh, products came from the first machine and four from the second machine but there are other possibilities to do the sub partitioning so that's not so important so anyway we have two uh, uh, two sub partitions now in our block and the number of comparisons is now, okay, we have three comparisons for this first block. And now we have the blue ones have to be compared with each other. And the green ones have to be compared with each other, which we have two. Let's see, uh, this is correct. Okay, okay, so this is uh, basically the number of entities. And uh, so basically that's the distribution of the subtasks. So basically we have three subtasks here in this second block. So green with green, blue with blue and green with blue. So these three uh, subtasks have a certain number of comparisons. And uh, so basically here we have uh, six pairs, here we have one pair and here we have nine pairs. So basically depending on the number of comparisons of each combination of the subtasks, we distribute now the comparisons and the subtasks among the reducers. So in the end we basically can uh, match the blue ones with the blue ones here in the first job and the other two subtasks are matched uh, here in the second job. Basically overall we get nine pairs in the first reducer and nine pairs in the second reducer which gives us a perfect speed up of two compared to the, um, to the sequential execution. <coughs> so that, that's the main idea, splitting the big blocks into these uh, subtasks and distributing the subtasks so that the number of comparisons is balanced. So that is, uh, was quite effective and simple. So we did some evaluations for site CI data, for example, and we get here, we used two blocking approaches, sorted neighborhood and standard blocking, and the speed up, well, the, the execution level almost the same here from uh, one machine with over 1,000 minutes, it is minutes, really a long time, until a few minutes with 100 machine, and the speed up went up until 80. <coughs> Okay, so this was our early work on parallel matching uh, using dedupe. And of course, there are many more recent uh, tools now available for entity resolution. So one of the more uh, popular tools is Magellan. Um, and it's really, uh, it aims for easy ease of use. Uh, and it's also, it also has a, a Python-based matcher called PyMatcher, and it can easily be used within data science applications, for example, developed in Python. And so it's in a way a library simply to uh, provide blocking and matching functionality. 
and it lets you choose between different possibilities, especially for similarity computation. And it also has that um, biggest plus, I think, support for machine learning, including for deep learning. <coughs> so um, that's also a possibility for you in the challenge if you want to make use of machine learning to use a Magellan tool for, uh, but it doesn't have clustering. So that's the downside. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you only, uh, you will end up with a similarity computation with a matching. But uh, if you want, I mean, our challenge, we have, I don't know, uh, more than 20 data sets, I guess. So, uh, so binary mapping will not be enough. You should also have some clustering approach. You could use uh, connect. Yeah, maybe there are other possibilities yeah. for clustering, yes. Yeah. Anyway, but in, in Magellan itself, it's not included. But it's not so clear whether the general clustering approaches are good uh, ideas for, I mean, you can use connected components, but that's normally not good. Uh, and other clustering schemes are not developed for entity clustering, are not necessarily the best choices uh, for, for to apply them here. But anyway, that's uh, what, what it is. So uh, <coughs> another tool, uh, by Simis Palpanas and colleagues is Chedai. Uh, I don't know what it stands for yet, another something. Uh, uh, so it can use for structured data and also for unstructured data. And they have a very big collection of blocking approaches, also called meta blocking approaches. So especially for unstructured data where you don't can rely on different attributes. So basically you look all attributes together basically, and you maybe pick any tree crumb or any n crumb from them as a blocking key. And then of course you have many, many blocks that are overlapping to a, much, to, to a large degree. And then you have to do some cleaning of these blocks uh, to avoid now redundant comparisons. So that's the main, uh, main um, consequence of using these uh, yeah, uh, blocking techniques on unstructured data. So they also provide a GUI. And they also provide uh, schema clustering approaches and also entity clustering but they don't support machine learning. So that's the downside. And they don't have a parallel execution. Also, uh, Magellan has a parallel execution, but only in a commercial version, <coughs> not in the open source version. And of course, uh, we have our famous tool, which will be explained in the second part uh, in more detail. So FAMER is fast multi-source entity resolution system, and it's based on Apache Flink, which is basically uh, comparable to Apache Spark. We have blocking, linking, and clustering. And we have all the parallel computation uh, in all steps, including for clustering. And um, we also support repairing clusters and incremental entity resolution. But in our current distribution, this is not yet included. So actually, uh, we, this challenge was the opportunity for us to, that's the first time to make this tool available actually outside. So uh, we have not included yet everything because some of the approaches are not yet published. So we didn't want to con distribute the, the code before the publication. So um, therefore we have, and also we have support for machine learning, but not in the distribution, unfortunately. So uh, if you want to use machine learning, you might use Magellan uh, instead of FAMER, but use FAMER only for the clustering. So that would be one possibility. So, uh, okay, so here's a rough comparison between Magellan, Jedi, and FAMER. So all support blocking, but I think Jedi has the most blocking uh, approaches because they also have this block cleaning idea, which is a consequence, I said, of these uh, meta blocking approaches. Matching is, of course, supported in all tools here, however, with machine learning in Magellan. So clustering is only supported in Jedi and in FAMER. Incremental ER is supported in FAMER, but not in the public distribution. And also repairing clusters. So uh, because when you add now entities to your clusters, you might find out, okay, the cluster is not the best one that we have originally created, so we have to change them. Or you might use some basic approach like connected components for initial clusters, and then you use FAMER uh, to repair these clusters, to make better clusters from these initial clusters. That's also possible. So we have a GUI in Jedi, and uh, so big data support or so parallel execution is only for Magellan in the commercial cloud matcher approach. And we have Apache's Flink in FAMER, but there's no support at the moment in Jedi for parallel execution. So scalability is not so clear uh, for Magellan and Jedi. I would think it might not be uh, scalable to very large data sets, but that's not a problem for the challenge, which is not too big anyway. So. Okay, any questions on these tools or? <coughs> so, the, 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 so, 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 so
Kim Jae Dai, they don't have the distributed uh, clustering. What, uh, that's what it means. Yes. It runs just on one machine. On one machine. So you have, uh, if you decided to compare them like with the uh, kind of different data sets to, to check what are the performances. Yeah, that's always a good idea to compare the tools. So if anybody has time uh, to compare the tools on a different, that would be a good idea. <laughs> good, maybe, uh, yeah, 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 good, exactly. So uh, I mean, there are many other tools also. So I mean, this is just a personal selection, uh, uh, bias selection, obviously. But uh, so I mean, that's a tool. I mean, I checked the recent Sigma VLEV papers and so on. So there are, I guess, uh, yeah major tools in a way, I think. But FEMA is not major enough. So as I said, it's the initial version. So if you have feedback on FEMA problems, so of course we are interested in getting them, in getting this info. Uh, a, a general question, yeah. how much do these tools depend on the application domain? In the sense that, for example, I mean, the great difficulty in the blocking function yes. is exactly related to your knowledge of the domain. You said I used the first uh, three letters of the <laughs> title, probably removing the initial article and things like that. Uh, then... <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but in general, I mean... Uh, yeah, well, the tools are supposed to be generic, so, but... Customize yeah, that's of course a problem. Menu. Okay, do uh, what is the manual part of the configuration? So, yeah. I mean, as I said, in most cases you have manually define your blocking keys, but there are also some approaches for automatic or learning-based approaches. But well, they are not really being used in practice, so maybe are not so uh, mature enough. So, in principle, there are papers claiming okay it can be done automatically, uh, but that's not really what is done in practice. So. So, I mean, of course, you should have some idea about the domain, uh, otherwise you will have problems to configure the system in the best possible way. So even if you have training data, if you have so many possibilities, if you have 20 attributes and you have 20 similarity functions for every attribute, you need lots of training data to find out the best combinations. So if you would pre-select, okay, we only consider these four attributes as candidates for matching, that would be already helpful. So. Uh, Anyway, so it really depends, and if the input is really dirty, of course, you can use some of these more refined blocking schemes, but uh, you you still have a problem with the matching part. So uh, it's really, that's a trivial problem, and uh, yeah, at the moment, uh, you really still need some expertise in the domain, so. And that's the problem with the product data, because that's really dirty, and uh, brings me now to the final topic in the first part. So uh, as I mentioned already, this holistic entity resolution uh, problem is we want to have scalability to many sources and high data volume. We want to have incremental entity resolution and also many entity types with high quality and little or no manual interaction. So, and we need these clustering based approaches. So uh, as I mentioned already, we want to represent the matching entities from K source in a single cluster and want to incrementally add uh, new entities and so one use case would be, uh, yeah, as I've also mentioned already, is this uh, product matching. For example, if you want to build a comparison portal for price comparison of products, so and the product offers come from web shops. So we have, of course, thousands of web shops, millions of products and product offers uh, continuously change, at least the price changes all the time. And we have many similar but different products and the data quality is quite limited. So here we have this uh, old slide. So. We have different camcorders, so you see here's a model called uh, Vixia HFS10, and here's a num Vixia HFS, uh, let's see, S100 here. Uh, so S100 is probably different than S10, so just having a zero in addition means a different product. So, uh, so one character difference could mean it's not matching anymore. So the string similarity could be very high, but still uh, it's a different product. So. So this just shows it's really not easy to find out what is really the matching product here. <coughs> okay, and then of course we have, uh, as I said, these many sources, many products, and what we would need is basically building clusters of matching products, and then we can do the price comparison and so on. And uh, actually we participated in a challenge <laughs> a few weeks ago, uh, which was posted in a KDD workshop on data integration to knowledge graphs. And they basically provided uh, camera product descriptions from 24 sources. And we tried to apply FEMA 
to this challenge. Uh, <laughs> And the first problem we observed was a schema matching problem uh, that we discussed already in the beginning. So, and each of these sources have a, has a widely different schema for describing their camera products. So, I mean, it was simple because we only had one product type, namely cameras. But I mean, uh, you see here, this is one example. And we have these properties, these attributes. And here's another data source with these attributes. And you see there's almost no similar or identical attribute except page title, because these product descriptions come from web pages. So page title is here and here. But OK, here's a Nick John Cool picks something from India and I don't know, a long string. And here's a, another string with UK digital cameras, whatever. So. Um, Okay, now we have planned, we have camera resolution, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is, okay, do we have to solve the schema matching problem first to do entity resolution? Or so basically, I mean, how would you now find out the matches between these products? So this is a similar problem than we had in our challenge. So we did not use, we didn't get the data for this challenge, so we have our own challenge, but. Uh, uh, we have, a th I think we have uh, harmonized schemas in our challenge, but this was not the case here. So I mean, one idea is, okay, we just use page title. Okay, let's go for page title, but okay, with string similarities alone, it, this is probably a match, these two, but we would not find this match because the string similarity is little, relatively low. But the other idea would be, okay, we just combine all the attribute values into a some, some kind of document and compare the combined attribute values which would also give very low similarity because the number of properties or attributes are so much different. So in some cases, we have 100 properties or attributes. In other cases, we have only five attributes. So this would be hugely differently sized uh, um, values. So uh, this is also not working very nicely. So what the best thing is we found, okay, let's find for the most frequent properties. So we just picked three or four frequent properties and we did some schema matching on these four or five properties. So then we do the entity resolution on that. But the question is, what are the matching properties? So, and here we could use the idea uh, that Paolo mentioned that if we have training data with matches of cameras, then we can find out, okay, what are the same values now, which would indicate maybe uh, the matches in the, in the attributes. But uh, based on the differences now in the number of attributes, this is only not a complete solution. It helps, but it's, uh, it's not a complete solution. So. So this shows uh, schema matching can be really a problem before we can do entity resolution. So and now if we have many sources, we do have to do a clustering of properties also or attributes. So this shows that we also need holistic solutions for this problem. So, so also we have decades of research on schema matching. I think there are still opportunities to do it also now in this uh, holistic way. So, um, new approaches are actually necessary. So okay, what is the general idea now for our solution approach? So we have input on new product offers and we have an existing product catalog or knowledge graph with associated products and offers and now we have to link in a way the new product offers to these uh, existing products in the knowledge graph. So what we do first is a pre-processing if the input offers, we extract manufacturer and we also try to uh, find these product codes, I call it. So you mentioned, uh, you have seen Nikon something, Canon something. So these are maybe the, the, the key components in the description that identify these electronic products for, uh, specifically. So we try to find these product codes to do the matching. And then we have a learning-based uh, categorization of product offers. We have to define or okay, find out what is the product type. Is it a camera? Is it uh, a uh, smartphone or what is the product actually. So if you have many product types, that's the first or the important step. And then we only want to match uh, within a product type. And then we need the learning-based matching of the product offered in the same category. So for each product category, we learn a different match classifier. And uh, we apply this now to the product offers of a certain uh, category. Okay. So basically what we did to the product code extraction is, okay, you see here this string, and this is the interesting part here. So uh, Vixia HFS 100, or here is another example. So in some cases we have two product codes, for example, for an accessory product like this battery, is basically, uh, this battery is usable for this Sony camera. So the question is, what is now the most relevant product uh, code? Is it this one or is it this one? So. So that's uh, making it more difficult. So we use regular expressions now to identify these um, 
product codes, so we, we first identify some features like this voltage and so this, uh, the strength and then anyway, so in the end we have two candidates and then we have to decide and this probably the first one is here, the right one. And in our original board, we also did some web verification. We simply queried Google with this uh, or some other search engine with this string and we, we checked the res response and we compared the response headline with this string and when the high similarity, then we said, okay, this is the right one. And so this gave a, a match for, for HLXF51 and not for the second one. So anyway, so that's a non-trivial problem, but it can be done. Uh, also in the challenge maybe uh, to help uh, finding uh, good matches. So, so that was our pre-processing basically. So what we do is basically we extract the product code, we do the manufacturer uh, extraction and also cleaning and we do the automatic categorization of product types. And then we have a training uh, for each product category. So we have training data and we uh, yeah, apply matches and we learn a classifier. So we have a classifier for every product category and then, of course, we can apply now this uh, model, this classification model to the product offers. We do the blocking on manufacturer and category, do the match application from the classifier and now determine now the matching uh, product. So that's in a nutshell how we can do product matching, which is not trivial. So, and it was also quite slow. So we have to have apply a parallel approach to do it in a relatively fast way in addition to blocking. <coughs> Okay, so that concludes actually now the first part. And so I think we're a little bit early, but... Uh, <laughs> Are there any, any further questions? Yeah. Um, in the beginning, you also said like the losses would be like one part of the equation. Yes. So is there, like, how do you see the problem of like angular steps? How do you see the problem of entity resolution for training data? Uh, is there any tools that like well, you have always this window approach. So typically you can consider all the entities which come in the same window. Uh, I mean, the question is, okay, do you want to have the matches in the stream or do you want to match now the incoming data to a big background reference source? In that latter case, it's not much different from what, what I presented. So, of course, the frequency of incoming data is higher than in the normal uh, change rate in, in the data. So. Uh, but in principle, you can apply the same techniques. Of course, you have to be very fast. So uh, you cannot really uh, uh, wait for minutes or so now to do a matching. So, I mean, uh, if you have now clustering already and you have blocking, of course. So, of course, each ent entity coming, you can apply a blocking key. You only have to consider a subset of the clusters. And then, of course, you compare with the cluster representative to find out, okay, is there a match? Some approaches are also an index or something to find these uh, candidates in a shorter amount of time. So, uh, so these are some of the approaches that are being considered for this kind of high, very dynamic matching. I guess that's something in this direction you have to apply. So you would say it's easier? No, it's... Uh, it's more challenging in terms of response time. You have to, be, if you really need real time uh, reaction, then of course it's uh, uh, a problem to optimize the time. In principle, it's the same uh, yeah, match problem, but uh, you have more time constraints. Okay. So you will not use uh, definition of uh, how you solve it. Uh, there's a shuffle phase in between mapping and use, and um, that seems to be a big bottom of discussion for the scalability, because it seems that you perform most of the Having work there, and that's not really the parallel. Yeah, well, that's right. So the data exchange in the old MapReduce was uh, via the disk. So basically, you write it out and you lead it in. So this was a bottleneck. So, so the main data movement yeah, yeah. But in uh, Spark and so on, you basically a main memory based. So it's uh, really much faster now. So it. I mean, if you perform the, your comparison there, there you go with the reduce phase. That's kind of the bottom. Of the How it's kind of parallel. Yeah, it depends on many configuration. Pama, you're right. It was relatively uh, uh, slow. But I mean, if you don't use map reduce and you can everything do in one machine, of course, you're always faster. But as soon as you have so much data that you cannot do it anymore in one machine, you have to do it in a distributed way. So, um, and yeah, yeah. And if you look into some of the papers, if you want to compute speed up, they normally don't compare now their response time in the parallel setting with a one machine response time, but they some okay start with two machines. So we have already a slow starting point with two machines with all the overhead involved. So uh, in a way, this is a trick now to get 
uh, decent speed up values, but uh, it basically it relates to your issue that that's certainly a bottleneck. So MapReduce has many limitations and bottlenecks, and so there are many papers describing these. So that's right, but. Uh, but in principle, the idea of having this mapping and reducing is similar in, in, in Spark and so basically, but you also get this load balancing issue, which was the main point I wanted to make. <coughs> okay, I think everybody's now ready for a break. Now the next part will be about entity clustering and uh, finally perhaps the primary preserving record linkage. Thank you.